Hello, real ones. Welcome back to part two of Frank Duke's story time. Real quick, huge thank you for all of the support on part one. Anyone who took the time to watch it, and for those of you who subscribed off of it, I truly do appreciate it, and it is my pleasure to continue being your annoying new friend. To honor you means everything to me. Let's shed some more blood. So when we last left Frank in part one, he was about to go headfirst into the movie's all is lost moment. The night before the grand finale of the Kumite, Frank is beset by the many things clouding the clear thinking he desperately needs to recenter, including this little thing that just gets funnier and funnier as I get older. Like, what if he had actually been on the train? Personally, I think it would have played into Frank's favor had he gotten to see big badass Chong Li reduced to the same circle of hell that is riding public transportation. Anyway, after some full splits rooftop meditation overlooking the entire city, which I don't know about you all, but always seems to do the trick of realigning me after an all is lost moment, it's officially time for the finals. There aren't going to be any finals, dupes. At least not for you. You aren't real. Now what? How are we gonna stop? Frank is able to defeat one of the movie's other sub-bosses in the semifinals using the old you kick me first and then I kick you trick that would go on to become part of Van Damme's special moves for other movies. And I would bet dollars to donuts that Frank takes credit for teaching him. And you know, it's cool, but a wildly ineffective strategy outside of maybe Dana White's looking for a bitch slap league. Neck attack! Wanna go punch the punch? <laughs> Good one! I did not specify! But then as a rebuttal, in his semi-final match, Chong Li takes it up just a notch in an effort to send a message to Frank. Finish him! He is shamed for this action by those in attendance, which seems kind of strange considering he apparently did this same thing in the last Kumite. I mean, fool me twice, right? Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? And then he personally lets Frank know what's up. You are next. Which as far as threatening lines go after literally murdering a guy with your bare hands in front of the person you're threatening, is basically right up there with this. And I'm just ferocious, I want your heart, I wanna eat his children. After what I'm sure was an awkward body disposal timeout period, it's time for the final match of the Kumite. The epic showdown between the defending champion and the upstart western prodigy. And according to Frank, it's depicted in the movie pretty much exactly how it went in real life. He claims he was blinded in the middle of the fight and forced to finish it with his vision impaired. However, it was not from a crushed up salt pill that was intentionally given to Chong Li from his coach like we see in the film. Rather, this was a mixture of sweat and dit dao, which is a very popular topical painkiller in Eastern medicine, made from a combination of natural ingredients that are steeped in alcohol. This liniment unintentionally made its way into Frank's eyes during the fight, similar to the same way Muhammad Ali was temporarily blinded during his first fight with Sonny Liston. Luckily for Frank, he's built for this and he's been trained in the art of the blind tea party, so he is comfortable fighting without the use of his eyes. After a hard fought scrap, Dukes overcomes all odds and is able to best Chong Li, even beating him to verbal submission by making him say Mate. Frank reclaims Ray's headband and takes it back to him in the hospital as a token of friendship, but according to him, the real Chong Li wasn't the one who eliminated the man who the Jackson character was modeled after, and that he actually had been eliminated much earlier as a result of a rear naked choke. However, as far as the real Chong Li, Frank has made no mention that I could find of of their paths crossing ever again after this, and he has claimed that he has heard differing accounts of what happened to him after his loss in the tournament. 
One story is he passed away in a car accident before the filming of the movie, and another is that he might have passed away due to brain tumors brought on by his fighting career, similar to the same style that almost killed Frank himself. But we're getting to that. It's worth noting too that there is literally no evidence of the murderous martial arts master Chong Li having ever really existed, and no one from the fighting world or otherwise claims to have ever encountered him, so read into that whatever you will. After his victory in the final, Frank is presented with the honorary katana sword that is given to the winner, which he dedicates to Senzo, fulfilling his goal and bringing us full circle. The story of what really happened to this sword is apparently very interesting as well. Frank says that the customary thing is typically for the winner to sell the sword back to the Black Dragons, at which point the money is then procured and then donated to a charity of the winner's choosing. With the money he was awarded for this, Frank says he chose to take it to the Philippines and use it to purchase a large number of contracts of young children who were essentially in a situation of indentured servitude to a band of pirates. Frank claimed at the time that Bloodsport was released to still be in contact with many of them and that at least one of them would happily shed blood for him. This shit just got rigged. What you gonna do, bitch? I'm gonna tell you what. I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna do. You know Luke and Perry from 20th and 25th? You ever heard of Rolling 20s, nigga? Mm -hmm. Anyway, now that he is the Grand Kumite champion, Frank keeps his promise to return home and finish his military service. He bids farewell to Janice before our credits roll and give us some parting information about Frank's fighting accolades, including his status as an undefeated world champion, amassing an unheard of record of 329 wins with no defeats over a period of the subsequent five years between 1975 and 1980 when he retired. When it comes to the question of proof of the legitimacy of these claims, Frank has attempted to point to a few pieces of evidence to corroborate his story. Pieces of footage have surfaced here and there over the years with various attempts to claim that they are or are not Frank from his fighting days. One famous one is that of who is thought to be French fighter Philippe Cardo, finishing guys with spinning kicks that sent them to the floor in pain. At times, Frank has tried to claim this footage to be his, but has also backed off a bit in recent years, saying things like, there's no way to be certain all the way, I've fought so many matches, it's a blur. I wonder how much Philippe Cardo's son threatening to sue Frank has to do with that. Dukes also claims to have Kumite footage that he has shown his most loyal students that reached the highest level of indoctrination, I'm sorry, I mean training. Frank has gone on to say that these events are recorded at all angles by as many as 16 high-speed film cameras, but when pressed about this in the legal arena with the perfect opportunity to prove all of his naysayers wrong, he was unable to do this because, mysteriously, all of this footage had been stolen by enemies of his, and there is somehow no other footage out there to support these claims. The trophy that Frank claims to have won from his Kumite victory and that appeared with him in the Black Belt article about the tournament has drawn a lot of controversy as well. Remember that LA Times editorial from 1988 that I mentioned in part 1 which claimed to have found no proof of Vicenzo Tanaka in Frank's area during the 70s? Well, the guy who wrote it, John Johnson, great name, also claimed to have the scoop on the actual way Frank procured his championship trophy as well. He wrote that the W.R. Moody Company, a trophy shop in North Hollywood, were shown photos of the trophy and they said that the base and the ceramic plaque were made by their company. However, there are some issues with the receipt Johnson claimed was his smoking gun. One thing people like to get hung up on is the misspelling of Frank's last name on the receipt, reading D-U-K-E-S rather than D-U-X. Honestly though, a misspelled name really isn't that giant of a revelation. You ever been to Starbucks? The far more interesting thing is that the notes describing the trophy style on the receipt and the design draw up of it don't appear to match the Kumite trophy at all. Frank's explanation of this receipt's existence is that it was for a different trophy that he commissioned them to repair for him after it had been damaged. If you ask me, which you did because you know you clicked on this video, there is certainly a plausible story to this and I have to side with Frank on this that the receipt proves nothing. In regard to the real trophy itself, Frank told Black Belt Magazine that the trophy is never really the property of the winner and its value makes it worth keeping it in a secure place. Hey, wait, wait do you have the trophy in your office right here? Yeah, I do actually. Can we see this trophy? Oh, see it, right? oh that, that's cool, man. Another of Frank's claims related to the Kumite is that martial arts actor Paco Prieto, best known for his role as the swimming pool fighter in Lionheart, can back up all of his Kumite tales based on the fact that he was apparently Mexico's champion and that the two nearly almost had a fight in the tournament. 
Paco has given interviews in recent years stating that he has never participated in a Kumitse and that Frank's stories of him being the champion of Mexico essentially equated to him beating up some drunks in a bar and winning some street fights. Not a good look for Frank. He lied. You never win. There is also the matter of Kenneth Wilson, a member of the Ministry of Sports in the Bahamas, saying that it would have been impossible for a martial arts tournament of that scale to be kept secret at that time, and that they would have known. But it would make sense to say that, wouldn't it? You might also be asking, if this thing is so secret, why is Frank out here telling the whole world about it? Well, he maintains that he was given the green light to go ahead and act as a spokesperson for Kumite co-sponsor, the IFAA, in an effort to draw more American fighters to the event. And as he puts it, to let people know the event is around, and it exists. So when the IFAA does ask them to think about trying out for it, they will be serious, because it is very real. So as you can see, the truth surrounding the levels of legitimacy of his Kumite tales as we know them from the movie are about as murky as it gets. And to be absolutely fair to Frank, he may have won a tournament amassed by an organization of his friends and colleagues, but it's sort of the same thing as me gathering up eight of my friends, forming pretty excellent national international street fighting, and then having a secret tournament in my backyard and declaring the winner the world heavyweight champion. Sure, it's technically true, but is it all of the truth? Okay, Frank, you win. But it's wrong what you're doing, it's a mistake. And for a tournament claiming to be determining who is the best fighter in the world, the obvious next question is, why didn't they approach legit known fighters like Muhammad Ali, Judo Jean LaBelle, or Horian Gracie? At the very least, Count Dante actually challenged Ali to a legit fight. Whatever the case, this next 12-year period of time in Frank's life from 1975 to 1987 is where we go from mostly harmless claims of being a martial arts wunderkin, trained by a real-life ninja and may or may not have won a secret underground competition, to things with more legal and moral implications as this is when Frank's alleged military career comes into play, as well as the events around the creation and production of Bloodsport. This is also where we dip into another sub-layer of the Dukes debate because with a lot of this going forward, we not only have to question the legitimacy of his claims, but also whether Frank actually made the claim at all. He has gone on to deny making many statements that have been attributed to him over the years, or argued that he was misrepresented in the retelling of them when he is seemingly nailed dead to rights after being challenged. Just a fair warning, it's about to get thick and we might be Quentin Tarantinoing a bit when it comes to the timeline. I think the best way to tell a story is by starting at the end, briefly, then going back to the beginning, and then periodically returning to the end, maybe giving different characters' perspectives throughout, just to you know, give it a bit of dynamism, otherwise it's just sort of a linear story. Just yeah. tell us what happened. In the interest of making this as easy as possible to follow, we will highlight things we know to be factually true in white, such as we know from Frank's official military paperwork that his service began on April 14th of 1975. Frank's claims will appear in red, such as him winning the Kumite in November of that same year. And if a claim is something that Frank has denied making or claims is misrepresented, we will highlight that in green. Speaking of that, let's knock off some low-hanging fruit right away. One of the first holes that people often punch in Frank's stories is that he claims to be a veteran of the Vietnam War. This would obviously be ridiculous right on the face of it, because the United States withdrew the last of its troops in Vietnam in early 1973, when Frank was still 16. And I think it's safe to say the only 16-year-olds who fought in the Vietnam War were Vietnamese. Frank maintains that he has never claimed to be a veteran of the Vietnam War, and that while the U.S. did end official military operations there in 1973, that it did not cease clandestine operations in Southeast Asia, including Vietnam. It is these types of missions that Frank says he took part in, and that the Vietnam War veteran thing is just a misunderstanding. This misinterpretation likely stems from a couple of places one of them being the very first article that Frank wrote for Black Belt Magazine on knife fighting techniques in October of 1980, where it clearly states, Frank Dukes is a former consultant to the armed forces who has trained military units in blade use and who has used and been decorated for his blade fighting techniques in actual combat in Southeast Asia. I think that it sort of goes without saying, but claiming in 1980 that you saw combat in Southeast Asia would certainly imply the Vietnam War to most every American who read it, but 
okay, fair enough. He did not specifically say that. Fast forward to May of 1987, an article for Inside Kung Fu Presents The Complete Guide to the Ninja, entitled Frank Dukes, The Man Behind the Legend, refers to him directly as a distinguished Vietnam vet, security expert, kumite champion, and Koga Yamabushi ninjutsu master. They also go on to say, after training with Tanaka for several years, Dukes was called on to serve in Vietnam and came out of the experience with a chest full of medals and a basic distrust of institutions like the military. Frank may dispute that he ever claimed that he was a Vietnam veteran or that these articles were just him being taken out of context, but looking at the official flyers for his schools during the 80s, it outwardly states that he is one of the most decorated veterans of the Southeast Asian conflict. Honestly, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt that he wouldn't really try to pass off such a seemingly obvious bullshit claim, but when you look at the evidence of it and the sheer number of others who did try this around the same time period, I just can't. What Dukes does still maintain is that he performed clandestine missions in Southeast Asia and made mention of having contact with tired Army Major General John Singlob, who allegedly headed the Phoenix program. This was a special program designed to identify Viet Cong operatives and to destroy their infrastructure using some of the more extreme methods. The problem with Dukes' claims are, firstly, the Phoenix program officially ceased existence in 1972, and while there are rumors of activities extending past that, there would have been no operatives left after the fall of Saigon in 1975, the same year Frank enlisted. The man he mentioned as running the program, John Singlob, was heading the Studies and Observations Group at the time, which was an entirely different program having nothing to do with the Phoenix. And despite Frank saying that the last time he saw Singlob was at a Spec Ops Expo in San Diego in 1993, Singlob did not attend this event and has gone on record to say that he does not know Frank Dukes. When I kept digging a little further, I found the story behind another of Frank's supposed Southeast Asian exploits, a mission known as Operation Sanction. In the early 80s, a well-known writer named Eric Blankney penned an article highlighting Frank for Crown Magazine titled, Frank Dukes, Fighting Back Again. In it, we're told of Lance Corporal Dukes' participation in a special operations group which crossed the border into Laos on a covert mission. Frank was one of the few who survived this, being forced to watch his friends die as he fought his way back into Thailand with bayonet wounds to the stomach and shrapnel in his back. After recuperating in a jungle hospital, he was shipped back home to the U.S., where the Marines decorated their returning hero. When information on this mission leaked, Dukes was one of the select few who was chosen to testify, and according to him, due in part to the increased public pressure on the Vietnam conflict, the military denied not only the mission's existence, but also Frank's existence as a soldier at all. Apparently at this congressional hearing, a military doctor testified to having treated Frank for bayonet wounds three miles from the Laotian border and that Operation Sanction really does exist. But as what will become a pattern with Frank, much of this was kept secret. No, it's, it's a secret. Frank has gone on to deny any knowledge of or claims of participation in Operation Sanction, and that this is fabricated evidence stemming from a promotional flyer coming from a Shidoshi Dukes Martial Arts Studios that he has never had any affiliation with. And he also later claimed that the Crown article was written by a junior college student who sensationalized it looking to get a good grade. It's worth noting that Frank attended Los Angeles Valley College, where Crown Magazine is published out of, and according to school transcripts, was a full-time student beginning in September of 1975. Another article with an interview from Dukes from 1981, this time for Kick Illustrated titled Can Ninjitsu Make You the Ultimate Warrior, makes mention of Frank's covert exploits, calling him one of the most decorated Marines to ever come out of Southeast Asia. This article also credits him for training his fellow Marines in Taekwondo and Hua Rongdo in 1975, and also a mission to South Korea in 1977 in the same capacity, training the Royal Korean Marine Corps. Which, of course, makes sense, because seeing as Taekwondo originates in Korea, if there's one thing that South Korean soldiers definitely need, it's a 21-year-old American teaching it to them. He also cites being an anti-terrorist consultant to the Samosa regime in Nicaragua in 1978, 
but left after only a couple of days. Keep in mind that Frank was also allegedly the undefeated reigning heavyweight Kumite world champion during this period, becoming the first fighter to exceed 300 fights in 1978, and fighting a total of 329 matches from the fall of 1975 until 1980, when he officially retires from competition, undefeated after one last open challenge. It is around this time of his official retirement that in March of 1980, Frank opens his first school in North Hollywood, Duke's Ninjutsu. He claims that he had previously been teaching in parks and private clubs prior to acquiring his dojo, and that he was already at a disadvantage promoting ninjutsu, seeing as most people didn't really understand what that was at the time. To be honest, it also wasn't taken very seriously as a martial art. Ninjutsu! What made matters even harder was that martial arts were experiencing a boom period in terms of interest, and even though there were lots of people looking to learn, there was fierce competition amongst teachers at the time attracting these students. Publicity was good if you could get it, but what was even better was if you had a hook, something to offer that other sensei could not. Accomplishments or techniques that made you stand out from all of the others. Perhaps, let's say you can claim you're an underground full contact fighting champion, or possibly that you did time in Southeast Asia and have tested your skills in real life combat. Anyway, it is six months later in September of 1980 that Frank's first Black Belt article is published, Unlocking Power, Keys to Success. The following month in October, another of his articles makes the magazine, this time on self-defense against knives. And then the crown jewel of the Duke's Black Belt trifecta is published in the November issue. Kumite, a learning experience. Frank claims Black Belt was after him for about six months to do the Kumite article, and that he initially did not want to do it, but that he finally acquiesced due to the Black Dragons insisting that he go ahead and do the article. You know, to monetize it and get some publicity for the tournaments that they didn't want a lot of public attention on and that a tremendous amount of illegal gambling happened at. At any rate, like we mentioned in part one, it was Black Belt's editor at the time, John Stewart, that authored and gave the final go-ahead for Kumite a learning experience, and in all reality, it's him that Frank should be dedicating a samurai sword to because John Stewart essentially made dukes with the publishing of this. He also provided a glowing letter of endorsement that would prove to be incredibly valuable to Frank. To whom it may concern. With the popularity of the secret art of ninjutsu on the rise, there are dozens of martial artists appearing to present themselves as experts on the ways of the ninja. However, the fact is that there are only two genuine non-oriental ninja known to the world today, and one of them lives in Japan. The other is Frank Dukes. Dukes is a professional consultant in the field of martial arts, a full contact kumite champion, and the instructor of some impressive students. He is also expert at setting up and performing stunts of all kinds, both real and illusory. There are other martial artists who will insist they are familiar with ninjutsu, but if it is important to have access to the real thing, Frank Dukes is your man. Remember when I said you need something to stand out from the pack in this world? Evidently the editor of the most popular martial arts magazine calling you the only genuine non-oriental ninja living in the United States is a good enough hook for not only attracting students to dojos, it also attracts movie producers looking to bring a legit ninja into the burgeoning martial arts genre. It's not exactly hard to see how this could have happened. Ninja fandom was at an all-time high, and Black Belt certainly knew that was their current bread and butter. In fact, Stewart had run four other articles in 1980 on ninjutsu before the one on Frank. The Ninja Mind, The Modern Ninja, Ninja Training Secrets, and Ninjutsu, The Mysterious Past. All of these were a collaboration between Stewart and Stephen K. Hayes, another practitioner of ninjutsu, but a seemingly more credible one. Hayes is likely that other ninja authority that is being referenced in the letter and has long been considered an enemy of Frank's, as he is frequently cited as one of the main people nefariously attempting to orchestrate Frank's downfall. It really sort of sets off alarm bells that Stewart clearly should have been enough in the know from his correspondence with Hayes that he should have seen through this, and he does kind of cover his tracks in the foreword to the article. From time to time, Black Belt learns of unusual events or occurrences in the martial arts. Events that, either because of their nature or because they occurred in the distant past, cannot be easily verified. Because we do not want our readers to be misinformed, Black Belt has a policy of strict verification of all facts pertaining to any article. 
In this case, several members of the staff have invested considerable amounts of time and energy checking the details of the following article. Although there is no convenient way to verify each and every detail connected with this story, the editors have verified enough of the basic facts to feel confident in publishing it. But since we are not at liberty to share the corroborating evidence with the public, we acknowledge that each reader may have a different idea of what the facts permit them to believe. Stewart has gone on record to say that shortly after the article appeared, he received information that made him question Dukes' military career. Sometimes we get caught, and we were naive enough to think that this added up. Maybe it was naivete, but looking at the timeline of events during this period brings another plausible explanation to light. Frank says that after seeing they were going to go ahead and publish this article that he realized that this would likely make for a good movie script, and so as a means to protect himself in a legal sense, on November 7th, 1980, he registers what he refers to as the first concrete treatment of blood sport with the Writers Guild of America, under the name Return of the Ninja. Side note, Dukes also says that it was when Canon Films released the Enter the Ninja series in 1981 that he realized he would have to change the name if he ever wanted to pitch it to them, which is when Frank says he officially started using the term and the title, Bloodsport. The quick turnaround time in relation to the article and knowing what we know about Black Belt's willingness to publish ninja-related content certainly raises my suspicions as this seems awful coordinated to me. Maybe it's all just coincidence and conspiracy, but I think some promises were made to Jon Stewart in return for his official endorsement. Whether it was intentional or not by Black Belt, Frank Dukes would never appear in another issue in any official capacity for them, which he attributes to anti-Semitism after the magazine discovered he was Jewish. Frank and his lawyer continue to stand on the fact that Black Belt never officially retracted the article in a separate issue of the magazine, and so they must still stand by this. John Stewart left Black Belt sometime in the early to mid 80s, but his successor Jim Coleman has gone on to say, The movie is built on false premises. From what we can ascertain, there has never been a competition like this. In response to the absence of a retraction, Coleman has stated that he was not there during the time this was published. Proving the claims without any doubt to be false could be considered almost as difficult as proving them to be true. The thing is, that's not how the burden of proof works in an argument. It is always on the person making the assertion. Basically, it's like me saying that I beat Frank Dukes in a secret match with one arm tied behind my back. Frank says I can't prove this ever happened, and I respond with, well, you can't prove that it didn't. So that basically makes me the world Kumite champion, and with that, I would like to announce my official retirement as the undefeated, undisputed champion. No, all bullshit aside, none of this stuff mattered to Frank as he now had all the credibility needed to begin a foothold in Hollywood, and his agent began circulating this letter everywhere they could. He began making contacts in the industry, and soon he would link up with an, at the time, small-time aspiring screenwriter named Sheldon Lettich. The two would hit it off quickly and become fast friends, and in approximately late 1982, they became official writing partners. Their first official project together, a screenplay titled The Naked Kill, was registered with the WGA in March of 1983, and another, entitled Alpha Deuce, was registered December 17, 1984. Frank also appeared in Sheldon's short film Firefight, which was filmed in 1983, and was just recently finally released to the public last month on Viking Samurai's channel. It's a really good short film and is the first on-camera appearance for not only Frank, but also Brian Thompson before he went on to have a pretty successful movie career, and Philip and Simon Ree before they were introduced to the world in the Best of the Best franchise. You should definitely give it a look if you have the chance. Anyway, Frank maintains that he did not want to be in Firefight and that Sheldon had to convince him to do so as he did not want to be an actor. This runs in opposition to what Sheldon Lettich says, alleging that Frank saw himself as a potential leading man in Hollywood with movie star looks akin to Tom Selleck. For what it's worth, Frank did have a role in another movie titled Get the Terrorists in 1987. You know you'll get what's coming to you. Look, midget brain, we're in this for the money. We're not in this to take orders from you. I'm tired of your double talk. But strangely enough, in a rare bout of agreement between the two, both he and Sheldon Lenich attest that there was never any conversations about Frank playing himself in Bloodsport. I don't know, to me it would seem as though someone who was that thirsty to be an actor would have made playing himself one of the conditions of making a movie of his life story. And speaking of that story, 
Sheldon Lenich's tellings of the origins of making a movie about Frank's Kumite exploits was from hearing the stories that he regaled at the time and thinking that it would make a great plot for a feature-length film. He claims the two never did sit down and write the script for it at the time for some reason, but that the idea would resurface when Sheldon was in the process of editing Firefight and becomes acquainted with producer Mark DeSalle. DeSalle had been producing pornos at the time, but had an idea for a martial arts movie that would eventually go on to become the plot of Kickboxer, and he wanted to pitch having this written by Lenich. Sheldon claims he was not impressed with the concept for Kickboxer, as apparently early pitch ideas had things such as Tong Po killing Kurt's mother with a kick to the face in their home. Sheldon says that it was at this time he pitches Frank's story to DeSalle, and that he immediately becomes more interested in that so a meeting is arranged between the three to start discussions. Frank's version of what happened next is that Sheldon brought Mark DeSalle to meet him at his dojo with the intention to talk logistics for possibly making Kickboxer, and that instead, DeSalle noticed the framed Black Belt article on the wall and he inquired about it. Frank says he told him the story and that he had adapted it into a screenplay back in 1981, and that was when DeSalle lost all interest in Kickboxer for the time and wanted to make this instead. Frank says at this point Sheldon began to get upset as he apparently feared that he was being cut out of his importance and financial stake in the project, and so he threatens to withhold access to DeSalle's financing and to essentially kill the deal unless he is given the writing credit. Frank alleges this all to have taken place in front of the man who was lawyer to both of them at the time, Michael Frankel, and he has supplied what he claims to be letters sent to both him and Lettich from Michael Frankel, proving his side of things. These are dated March 3rd, 2020, and I'm certainly not the grammar police, but yeah, you'll just see as we go through. Dear Sheldon, you seem to forget about Alpha Deuce and Bloodsport and you in 84 to 85 bargaining with Frank for a written by credit on the screenplay you were hired for by DeSalle and Frank had the limited life rights contract with DeSalle by saying to me and Frank as you were editing Firebase Short, this is my price for bring in DeSalle's money. You had story discussions about Bloodsport in front of me way before you filmed Firebase Short. I have always said you are entitled to that credit on the screenplay, but not on the underlying life rights. You were only allowed on a work for hire to write on the material that DeSalle licensed from Frank. Frank retained all novelization rights to the Bloodsport story. Further, DeSalle's attorney and Cannon's requested and got tapes of Frank's fight documentation on his life, etc. Another letter dated September 18th, 2019. Sheldon, you did not write Bloodsport from conversation with Frank. He had a full story that was to show other people in the industry before you and he found DeSalle. Also, you only according you your contract had the license to write about true incidents in Frank's life that he would have had to share with you. I too sick to deal with both of your bullshit. You had an absolute right to write the script and get written by credit. I was there when you two agreed upon that rather the original agreement to co-write the script with Frank as you did with Alpha Deuce as you compensation for bring in money. Sheldon, stop attacking me for not agreeing with you. You seem to forget that you and Frank had me looking for money on your joint projects as a producer and then took the projects back. Sheldon, you did not write Bloodsport from conversation with Frank. He had a full story that was to show other people in the industry before you and he found to sell. Also, you only according you your contract had the license to write about true incidents in Frank's life that he would have had to share with you. I too sick to deal with both of your bullshit. You had an absolute right to write the script and get written by credit. I was there when you two agreed upon that rather the original agreement to co-write the script with Frank as you did with Alpha Deuce as you compensation for bring in money. Sheldon, stop attacking me for not agreeing with you. You seem to forget that you and Frank had me looking for money on your joint projects as a producer and then took the projects back. Frank says that against his lawyer's advice, he willingly gave up the writing credits to Sheldon and agreed to make his money when it came to points on the movie's final haul. What seems to be the reasoning for this resurgent push for the insistence of a writing credit by Frank is that in the age of streaming, writers continue to get small residuals every time a movie is watched, and these add up as the access to streaming has exploded. Sheldon Lettich maintains that in a legal sense concerning script writing, Frank provided only the source material of his true life story, and the problem is that when it comes to writing credits for what becomes the script, that's not how they work. Leonard says, ironically, had Frank said from the very beginning that this whole thing is made up, there would be no question as to him getting writing credits for creating these characters and general plot. 
Frank still argues that the existence of the treatment for Return of the Ninja in 1980 completely destroys that narrative and that he has always been the real writer of Bloodsport. Sheldon Lettich's response to that is amazingly dismissive. Now does that sound like it's about a tournament? Return of the Ninja? Oh, that's about a martial arts tournament. No, it's not. And the script does not exist, okay? And if it exists, show it to us. Frank won't show this to anyone. He just makes stuff up. I'm tired of your double talk. What we do know as absolute fact is that Frank sold the rights to his true life story to Mark DeSalle on June 15, 1985, and DeSalle officially hired Sheldon Ledich as per the terms of the contract to render such services as we require to write and revise an original screenplay based upon the life story of Frank Dukes, the rights to which we own and which we assign to you for this writing assignment entitled Bloodsport consisting of a first draft screenplay and one set of revisions thereto, and a final draft screenplay or polish base thereon suitable for production of a feature-length theatrical motion picture intended initially for theatrical exhibition in the United States. Which in a legal sense is about as rock solid as Ray Jackson's head. Neither is this. <laughs> for you. One thing life has taught me is that 100% of human brains will recollect controversial moments in their lives painted with themselves in the best light. I also know that when money and legal matters get involved, it gets incredibly personal and it brings out the worst in everyone. So let's be clear, I don't expect the complete truth from anyone involved. But in my opinion, regardless of whether this story is true or not, Frank Dukes does deserve a writing credit for it, and I think it was just bad business decisions in a cutthroat industry that cost him. Whatever the truth is behind how the script came into existence, the finished product would be acquired by a relatively obscure independent production company called Canon Films in March of 1986. Dynamite. Canon was one of the amazing smaller scale outfits of the 70s and 80s that unfortunately did not survive into our time as they were absorbed by some of the juggernauts of the industry when they began buying up and consolidating smaller companies. But at the time, they were known as a studio willing to take big risks on ultra genre specific films, unknown stars, and projects that were generally seen as not worth the bigger company's risk. This ballsy approach led to producing some real hidden treasures of 70s and 80s cinema, and it led to an at the time relatively unknown Belgian martial artist getting his first real big break when he was boldly cast in Bloodsport's lead role, Jean-Claude Van Damme. Van Damme had appeared as an uncredited extra in the 1984 canon film Breakin, seen here giving us an example of the sweet dance moves that he would later show in Kickboxer. He also had just recently completed his first featured on-screen appearance as the villain in the film No Retreat, No Surrender, where he would show an example of the sweet martial arts moves that would later make him a star. Accounts on how he landed this role seem to differ, but I suppose in a way they could all be true. It should surprise absolutely no one at this point to hear that Frank's telling is that it was his personal lobbying for Jean-Claude that led him to be cast in the role rather than the studio's apparent original choice, Michael Dudikoff. Frank believed that the two bared a solid resemblance from when he was in his early 20s, and yeah, I can see that. Sheldon Ledditch has recently relayed a pretty famous story that had been corroborated by Van Damme himself as well as Michelle Kesey, that while riding down La Cienga Boulevard in LA, Van Damme happened to see the owner of Canon Films, Menachem Golan, coming out of a restaurant. The two had previously met at Cannes Film Festival when Jean-Claude was hustling his name around trying to get signed, and seeing an opportunity to make another impression on Galan, he quickly pulled over and approached him. Van Damme is notorious for his ability to throw a kick at a person's face with such precision that he can come within a couple of inches without ever touching them, and when Galan got close, he got his attention by saying, Hey Menachem, remember me? Jean-Claude Van Damme! and threw his trademark fake-out kick. Galan happened to be looking for a person to play Frank Dukes, and this impressed him enough to get a business card and an appointment with him to talk future ideas. Over the years, Van Damme has told a couple of versions of how he got this role, but hands down my favorite one is the story he told Collider Podcast, which I'm going to choose to believe is the events of his follow-up meeting, and when you have the time, you should really give it a listen because it is great. He, was, he said, you want a glass of milk? I said, yeah. You want some cookies? I said, yeah. Put 
you think? And they go, Garin, bring me Bloodsport. Sheldon Lettage says that Van Dam first came onto his and Dukes' radar when they were recommended by Mark DeSalle to go see No Retreat, No Surrender and give their opinion of whether quote unquote Jean Claude Van Dam would be a good fit. After seeing it, they both agreed that this was their guy and perhaps this is where Frank believes he helped to secure him the role. But with their financing in place, their main star cast, and an incredibly experienced assistant director, New Arnold, tapped to take his first shot in the driver's seat as director, filming of Bloodsport would commence on location in Hong Kong in the summer of 1986. Frank has said over the years that he personally was the one to painstakingly train Van Damme to be able to play him convincingly, and the fight choreography, which is an amalgamation of Frank and Michelle Kesey, really is fantastic and ahead of its time. With only a small budget, this movie had to make the best use of everything it had, and it did an incredibly commendable job at that. Even though it completed filming in 86, Bloodsport would actually sit on the shelf for quite some time, and there was even some question about whether it would get a theatrical release at all, or just go straight to VHS, which in those days only happened to the bottom of the barrel. Part of this was simply because Canon had overextended themselves a bit with their risk taking, and were having some financial problems on the distribution side of things. A bigger reason, however, was because the first cut of the movie looked very, very different to the finished product, and Menachem Golan was so disgusted that he was prepared to nuke it straight to video store shelves, and despite signing a three-year picture with Van Damme, he referred to him as poison and wanted no more to do with him. Bloodsport was in a proverbial bloody heap with its eyes blinded by salt, but it was not completely defeated and it was about to have its comeback moment. Canon Films had an ace in the hole by the name of Michael J. Duffy, whom they had previously used as sort of a fixer on badly edited movies, and after working his magic with the footage, that is exactly what he did, and he truly saved the movie by delivering the much better version that we know as the final one. This began to get positive buzz amongst the few who were able to see it, and despite Galan's trepidation, they decided to give it a West Coast test release to give it a shot. It ended up overperforming, and this would lead to its official widespread nationwide release on February 26, 1988, and it was certainly worth the wait for all involved, as it netted a very impressive $50 million all in total against a budget of about $1.5 to $2 million. It would spawn three direct-to-video sequels that neither Dukes, Van Damme, nor Lettich have anything to do with, and they progressively get worse as they go. The new main character, played by Daniel Bernhardt, is named Alex Cardo and is basically trying to be Frank Dukes so hard that they might as well have called him Drank Fuchs. Bloodsport 8, no Fuchs given. Look for it straight free on your Crackle app or whatever. You like watching people get fucked for free? But at least for the second one, they got back Donald Gibb to play Ray Jackson. And as you can see, even Chong Lee stomping his brain in hasn't changed him one bit as we get some vintage Ray. Oh my, my, will you get a look at that? Who's she? Kim Pam, that's the first woman they ever invited to the Kumite. This is she something. she eat your life. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> oh, yeah. Come up here. Come up here to the best of both worlds. I'll beat you like a woman and beat you like a man. <laughs> anyway, after Bloodsport premiered, Frank enjoyed a nice boom to his public profile. His collaborations with Sheldon Lettich and Jean-Claude continued as he would also serve as fight choreographer for another fan favorite, the 1990 film Lionheart. And he began a writing partnership with Van Damme as well, working and co-authoring a screenplay with the super originally titled Enter the New Dragon. By all accounts, his schools were also doing very well with him having all sorts of offers from investors to expand, and it appeared that all signs were coming up dukes. At least for a bit. However, shortly after the movie came out was when we got the first major signs of Frank's detractors stepping forward, with the previously mentioned LA Times article calling everything into question. This began a vicious cycle over the coming years of Frank grasping to verify his claims, only for more and more of his stories to be challenged. One such instance occurred in April 1993 at the International Martial Arts Festival in Bercy, a neighborhood of Paris, France, where Frank would display new feats of badassery not yet seen to the world. He performed his patented question mark kick through two champagne bottles, he dim mocked a Jack Daniels whiskey bottle into pieces, and then the coup de grace, Frank becomes the first person ever to punch through bulletproof glass. <laughs> That's pretty.
pretty goddamn impressive. So let's start with the three bottles. Now, it's not for me to definitively say, but many have made the accusation over the years that rather than being real bottles, that these were made out of candied glass. I'm no expert on the matter, but just from my own perception, when these bottles are broken, they don't really appear to shatter in the way the real glass does, and they instead seem to powderize, leaving trails, which is very consistent with candied glass since it's just finely ground confectioner's sugar. The bulletproof glass is a bit more nuanced when we dig into it though. There are two types of bulletproof glass. The ones that you would see in a bank are made from actual glass that is laminated with plastic layers in between the glass ones. The other, much cheaper kind, isn't actually glass. It's made of a shatter-resistant polycarbonate named Lexon, and when used with at least three quarters of an inch thickness, it can be used as an alternative to the layered glass. You would see this inside of like a gas station or a hospital. This is the type that Frank claims to have broken, even though he did misspell it. And again, there is no definitive proof that this is not indeed Lexon, but there are many caveats. Some have disputed the thickness of the panel from the photos, and others have also pointed out that the impact site proving the integrity of the Lexon appears to be inconsistent with a 9mm bullet impact as Duke's claims, and rather it is likely from a pellet round. There is also the fact that Lexon degrades when exposed to ultraviolet light and can shatter if not replaced once a year per the manufacturer's suggestion. But maybe these claims are legit, and this is just the deceptive work of another well-known Frank Dukes hater. Science. She blinded me with science! Another gathering later that same year didn't go quite as well though for Frank. He attended the second annual Draca Martial Arts Trade Show in Los Angeles, where he would have an infamous altercation with a fighter named Zane Frazier. The source of the conflict and how it went down differ depending on who is telling the tale, but what is for sure known is that Frank had hired Zane to teach some classes for his dojo, and Frazier claims he was never paid for this. At the time, Zane had just recently won the World Kickboxing Federation's Super Heavyweight Championship and was being scouted by Art Davey and Horian Gracie to fight in the very first UFC event. This event was where they intended to approach him about his participation, and Davey has told the story that when they arrived, there were police already on the scene, as Frazier had apparently kicked the shit out of Frank Dukes when they encountered one another. Duke says that it was him the UFC founders had been after for about a year to fight in an exhibition at the first event, and that Frazier had been hounding him ever since about being the opponent, so much so that apparently Dukes filed a restraining order against him. Frank claims that Zane approached him with an entourage looking to goad him into taking a swing as a publicity stunt, and when Frank challenged him to settle it in the ring that they had there, this caused Zane to backtrack a bit, and everyone evidently had a good laugh at his expense. He then left and returned about 20 minutes later, and Frank alleges that when he was knelt over signing an autograph for a kid, Frazier sucker punched him in the back of the head with brass knuckles. Legendary MMA referee Big John McCarthy was in attendance that day and witnessed this altercation and has said Frank's version is complete fabrication to save face for himself, and that he genuinely got his ass kicked by Frazier after a verbal confrontation. I'm tired of your double talk. Frank would later attempt to sue Zane Frazier, but lost in court. Zane Frazier did go on to fight in UFC 1, and he was defeated in the first round after kickboxer Kevin Rozier knocked him down with strikes to the back of the head, and then finished the fight with foot stomps that would make Chong Lee wince. Despite being on the losing end of an altercation with a man who ended his MMA career with a 4-11 record, when Frank was asked if you placed him in his prime into the UFC today, would he be the heavyweight champion? He responded emphatically, oh yeah, without a doubt. He also claims that they wanted to call it the UFC as an homage to him and the moniker bestowed on him by Vic Moore several years earlier, the ultimate fight champion. But he never appeared in any official capacity for them and the founders have never confirmed that he was the reasoning for the name being what it was. Anyone who knows the story of UFC 1 knows that it was essentially an advertisement for Gracie Jiu Jitsu, and if this tournament was built around anyone, it was them. And this is also where we circle back to that godfather of MMA claim from part 1. It goes without saying that Frank Dukes did not invent or popularize cross training among disciplines, and so that claim is a bit dubious right on its face. It's a liar. You're a liar. Now what is true is that the movie Bloodsport certainly did help to inspire the idea behind UFC 1, and so in that regard, he is not completely full of shit as he was one of the people responsible for the movie. 
but he is definitely not a pioneer of mixed martial arts in the way that I'm sure he would like to be known. Certainly not the Godfather, more like the shady next door neighbor. The bigger, much more unquestionable inspiration that it provided was for the original fighting game boom of the early to mid 90s, specifically Mortal Kombat, with the character of Johnny Cage being a direct homage to Jean-Claude Van Damme and Bloodsport. Aren't you a little old for video games? Despite getting his clock cleaned in public, Frank says that this was actually a blessing in disguise because the ensuing medical visits and the scans caused from this would be what led to the discovery of a massive brain tumor. During this time, Dukes lost use of one side of his body and had problems with his vision, which explains the eye patch and interviews around this time and his signature use of sunglasses going forward. He also claimed the memory loss that was caused from this as part of his defense when it comes to remembering details of his accomplishments, and uses it almost as a get out of jail free card when challenged to the contrary. There's been speculation from some that Frank did not have a brain tumor and that he was really suffering from the effects of the Fraser beating instead. As a survivor of childhood cancer myself, I am not going to speculate or accuse anyone of this, you're free to make up your own mind. Things sort of start to fall apart for Frank though personally at this time as he suffers a string of unfortunate events. Some of his schools were forced to shut down, his wife at the time filed for divorce, but the most damaging moment of Frank's entire career in my opinion is in March of 1996 when he releases his book, The Secret Man and American Warrior's Uncensored Story. Again guys, similar to like I said in the previous video with the Black Dragons and Count Dante, to be honest, I could likely spend another entire video delving into Frank Dukes' memoir of his apparent Cold War era covert missions that read like a Tom Clancy novel, but since we're already approaching the limit of anyone's toleration of me in one sitting, the abridged version is going to have to do here. Essentially, Frank alleges he was approached in 1981 at a public restroom urinal by a guy introducing himself as quote, the fucking head of the CIA, Will William Casey. Evidently, Director of Central Intelligence Casey knew Dukes' father and personally selected him for the task of bringing down former agents who had gone rogue. Casey would be Dukes' personal handler, and this would all have to be done in a way to keep it completely secret from absolutely everyone else in the agency. This is why he is not, as he puts it, a card-carrying member of the agency. The book then traces what amounts to eight of Frank's missions as a CIA secret agent from 1981 to 1987, such as destroying fuel tanks in Nicaragua, being the lone survivor of a five-man team sent into Iran during the height of its war with Iraq to destroy a chemical weapons plant, and being part of a joint CIA-KGB task force assigned to investigate a 1979 Russian anthrax disaster. The book also contains in its foreword what would seemingly be an endorsement from retired Navy Commander Larry Simmons, who headed SEAL Team 5, lending it a bit of authenticity. However, there were some real issues that presented shortly after its release when several members of the military spoke out against the validity of the book, including General Norman Schwarzkopf, former director of Central Intelligence Robert Gates, and the man who wrote the book's foreword, Larry Simmons. Simmons went into writing military adventure novels after he retired, and as it turns out, shared the same literary agent with Frank Dukes at the time the book was due to be released. Simmons says that he was contacted by his agent and asked as a favor to write a generic foreword for the book, which he did sight unseen. When it came out, Simmons says, Within reading the first few pages, I knew that I had been deceived into lending credibility to a fraudulent endeavor. Frank Dukes is not an American hero. He is a con man. Dukes' alleged contact, DCI Bill Casey, passed away before the book was published, and so he was never able to say his piece on the matter, but it is pretty obvious to most everyone that even if Frank was a secret operative, the idea of Casey being his sole handler is preposterous. The DCI's duties are such that there is simply no way for them to be involved in the rigmarole of one particular operative's assignment, since, you know, they're in charge of the whole agency. There is something genuinely funny to me though about the thought of Frank Dukes being at a urinal and being approached by some crazy dude just claiming to be the head of the CIA and then conning Frank for years into thinking he was an operative. You have been compromised. Abort mission, destroy phone. Destroy phone. Anyway, after enough holes had been punched in the story that it was undeniable they had to do something, 
publisher HarperCollins was forced to pull the book from the shelves just weeks after its release, which Frank still maintains was his choice. He would be interviewed by Soldier of Fortune magazine in an effort to give him a chance to explain his side of things for what would be an article in their August 1996 issue titled Full Mental Jacket, and they would be absolutely merciless in their examination of his stories. They cover the missions I mentioned earlier and the reasons why they just don't add up, and for the sake of time, I won't rehash those, but go check it out when you get done here if you want to hear more about these. Frank also appears in their November 98 article about Stolen Valor. He would of course sue them, and he would of course lose this case. Speaking of Stolen Valor, this term was popularized in a 1998 book by the same title by retired Army officer B.G. Burkett, who examines high-profile cases of individuals who are accused of falsifying their military records, and Frank is one of the subjects of this book. Frank says the sheer fact that the CIA acknowledged it to officially deny it is proof enough of its existence, and while that is unusual for them to do, it's also incredibly unusual for a somewhat celebrity figure with a sizable audience to come out and make easily verifiably false claims. With the help of the Freedom of Information Act, it wasn't long before the public started attaining Frank's real military records, which unsurprisingly to most, showed a very different story. Frank Dukes served as a member of the Marine Reserves from 1975 to 1981. He would have performed the standard one weekend a month that reserve members are required to fulfill, but certainly not a full-time soldier. His role in the reserves was that of a wireman, or a person who strings communication wire between poles. Many intelligence experts have pointed out that the prospective operatives would not have been plucked from training like this. It simply does not work that way. And that honestly, Frank would have had nothing to offer to warrant such recruiting. He would receive a Class 3 status listing on May 8, 1978, and in the book Stolen Valor, it states, In May 1978, Dukes fell from a truck in the motor pool while painting the vehicle. The Class 3 transfer would appear to have made Dukes ineligible to perform active duty, and he would have been in the inactive reserve until the end of his contract in 1981. His records show no medals or commendations, no overseas assignments, but they do show a January 22, 1978 referral for psychiatric evaluation due to flighty and disconnected ideas. But of course, these were evidently purposely fudged by the military to discredit him. If you ask Frank for proof of these claims, well, he will point you to the United United States Navy SEAL CFC Spec War Manual K4310097, which is the handbook for the Naval Special Warfare Combat Course. In it, there is a special thanks section listing names who contributed to the courses, and Frank's name is listed there. He has used this as his mic drop of legitimacy for a very long time at this point, and to those who aren't in the know, this obviously sounds very official and legit. However, an inside source who worked with Frank during this training course has confirmed that he taught a very, very limited number of techniques using edged and impact weapons, and his contributions may or may not have been used after the session. In reality, the tactics used in the close quarter defenses hand-to-hand -hand combat training comes from a man named Dwayne Dieter. And if you look at the list of the rest of the names, you might also see Horian and Hoist Gracie's names listed there as well. So I suppose this proves their status as covert operatives as well. If you're wondering, just like I was, how someone like Frank could end up teaching tactics to soldiers, I will defer you to ex-Special Forces operative Chris Flynn's explanation. Today, right now, this very second, if you wanted to, you could literally call up to the Special Operations Department at Fort Bragg and offer your services to train Special Forces and they are more than likely going to welcome you with open arms because that's the kind of people they are. They always like to bring in new stuff and so if you have something new to offer that will be of some benefit, they're going to take it. So it's not unheard of for people to say that they went over and taught Special Forces, Navy SEALs, Green Berets, etc. It happens all the time. You can literally go to Fort Bragg and talk to the Sergeant Major and say, hey, I'm a badass and this is what I know and I'd like to show it to your soldiers. And not only will he probably let you do it, Afterwards, he will probably write you a nice letter talking about your contributions to whatever group and you would leave with your letter in hand and you can go home and put it on your shelf or whatever. Viking Samurai did a whole interview with Chris and he extensively breaks down how Frank's story is just simply not plausible. I highly recommend that as well for more info if you haven't seen it, I will link the video in the description. In my opinion though, the most damning piece of evidence from The Secret Man lies on this page where a picture of Frank appears with the caption, 
down in the trenches in 1983. The 357 Magnum was the sidearm that distinguished special unit personnel. Many at the time pointed out the rifle in the photo with him is a 22 long rifle and asked why a covert CIA operative would be equipped with something akin to hunting small animals. Even as recent as 2011, Frank was defending this picture on his Facebook account, stating, The rifle. It's not mine, but the 357 Magnum is. Issued to SEAL Team 6 and other specialized anti-terror operators in the 1980s. I was not a SEAL, but grateful that they thought enough about what I contributed from my experience and studies to list me as a source contributor in their manual, page 10. The problem with this picture is that while it was taken in the trenches, they were the trenches of Camp Pendleton, being used to film the 1983 movie Firefight, which we can see here. Same outfit, same hairstyle, same place, same old dukes. Uh, you lie! What is in my opinion though the most egregious of Frank's claims over the years is the claims of being a Medal of Honor recipient. Now mentions of him having received a Medal of Honor and a host of others including the Navy Cross, Silver Star, Bronze Star, and Purple Heart have appeared in several articles including a lot of the ones that we mentioned earlier. And some of them have alleged that in the early days, anytime he was confronted with evidence to counter his claim, he would pivot and say this was all of course done in secret and there would be no record of it. Nowadays, Frank denies that he has ever made the claim to have received a Medal of Honor, and these are just lies being fabricated by his enemies to attack his image. He insists that he would never make a claim so easily fact-checked to come up false, but it wasn't so easy to do so back then, and if you stuck to making these claims outside of people who were in the know, it was very hard to prove false, and the gravity of such claims gives most people the benefit of the doubt. Well, surely they would never lie about that, right? They gave you. Congressional Medal of Honor. This isn't the first time medals he supposedly won have raised concerns. There is this picture of him with several medals that many have pointed out are from multiple branches of the military and that they are wrong sequentially and wouldn't appear that way. Frank explains this away by saying this is a well-known photo of him before he went to a costume party when he was still in college and it is used as another tool to discredit him. Then there is the Sheldon Lettich story, who claims Frank personally not only told him he won the Medal of Honor, but showed him one that he had in his possession. Sheldon Lettich had actually seen combat during the Vietnam War, and stated that it was believable to him that Frank had actually been there also. Sheldon says that he wasn't really skeptical yet of Frank having no reason to be, and so he just believed it. He says it wasn't until later talking to some military folks with a book of previous Medal of Honor winners who questioned this that he himself began to as well. Frank shockingly says this never occurred and that this is just another of Sheldon's lies. The problem is Sheldon isn't the only one who has come forward with this sort of tale, and it would seem as though enough legit people have called him out as having told them or someone that they know that he was awarded a Medal of Honor that this just screams of Frank covering his bases on a fact that he never thought he would be checkmated on. You lie! You're a fucking liar! Shut up! Unfortunately for Frank, the hits kept on coming. Remember that script for Enter the New Dragon? Well, it had undergone some rewrites with a couple of new people brought in, and it was working under the new title, The Quest. This was released on April 26, 1996, and it ended up being a cult favorite amongst Van Damme's catalog of films. However, Frank says that he noticed that the finished product looked far too similar to Enter the New Dragon, and that all he received was a story by credit rather than credit as the writer. He also alleges that at one point while recovering from brain surgery and when those in the room thought he was not conscious to have heard, Sheldon Lettich was on the phone making plans to cut him out of it, which is just a ridiculous visual if you really think it over. Like, even if he were going to take a phone call about plans to screw you out of a movie project while visiting you at the hospital, that he would at least take the phone call outside? If we're being completely honest, The Quest is essentially just a tournament movie like Bloodsport before it. It has a different story written around it, but it centers around a secret martial arts tournament. I remember as a somewhat younger kid when this movie came out thinking that, oh sweet, it'll be like another Bloodsport. And it is a great movie, but it isn't some standout juggernaut of a story that would land you bigger work in Hollywood. But it is very obvious to me anyway that Frank's bigger concern was one thing. Where's the money? When are you going to get the money? Why aren't you getting the money now? And so on. Frank sued Van Damme seeking $1.5 million in Van Damages. His claim was that Jean-Claude had offered him $50,000 for his writing and then points on the final movie where he could make the real money. 
Frank also claimed to have secretly tape recorded Jean-Claude when he said this, and that he could have proved it, but that the tapes were in his apartment when it was condemned from the Northridge earthquake in 1994, and he was not allowed entry in to get them, and that by the time he was, they had been stolen. The lawsuit obviously drove a wedge between Frank and his on-screen betrayer, and in the middle of it was Sheldon Ledich, with both jockeying for his support. Sheldon claims to have done his best to stay out of it, and that while Frank was making valid points to his case, that he lost his jury when he went off the rails making outrageous statements to the effect of Jean-Claude being jealous of Frank for dating the sister of his current wife Gladys Portuguese, and that Van Damme really wanted her for himself. Sheldon says that this was the tipping point for him, and when he told Frank that he should not have done that, the two had a heated argument, and that was the last of what remained of their friendship as they went their separate ways. For what it's worth, I do believe that Van Damme made these promises to Frank, and even Sheldon Ledich has been quoted as saying that Jean-Claude told some lies on the stand as well, and that he likely did offer that because he would offer stuff like that all the time in passing when talking about projects and then forget about it later. There is also this piece from his time on the stand that was ultimately ruled inadmissible by the judge. That Mr. Dukes had a piece of the back door on the movie. Yes Another or no? Another piece. Yes or no? Back door, it's a for an expression. I mean, I, no. You didn't say that to him. Yes, I said it, but I mean, can I explain myself? Because I'm just asking if you said it. You, you it's chance, like, it's you like, don't, don't be frustrated. I'm not frustrated. It didn't matter though, as Frank lost in court again, and then moved away from the Hollywood scene shortly after. In true Frank Duke's fashion though, even when he deserves a win, he has to go and totally unredeem himself. Frank's involvement with the quest apparently extended to, for a time, claiming to be the fight coordinator for the movie as well, and as the story has been told, one day he was asserting that claim at a luncheon gathering to a gentleman sitting at his table, not realizing that the man he was talking to was Stephen Lambert, the actual fight coordinator for the movie. After Frank received a tongue lashing from Lambert, he says he promptly left, and that had to have just been amazing. Anyway guys, after this Van Damme continued making movies and had a serious roller coaster of a career in Hollywood, culminating with somewhat of a resurgence since he appeared as the villain in The Expendables 2. He has remade some of his classics, and there has been rumbling several times of a Bloodsport relaunch. In fact, there is a Kickstarter project out there gaining funding for a movie called The Last Kumite, and even though it doesn't involve Jean-Claude, I am very excited to see where it goes. And I have it on good authority, this is not the last time we will be talking about the muscles from Brussels, so I will stop there. Sheldon Ledich would go on to become a successful screenwriter, having a hand either writing or directing movies like Rambo 3, Only the Strong, and several Van Damme favorites like Lionheart and Double Impact. He pops up from time to time in interviews on YouTube, and he has a recent book out called From Vietnam to Van Damme that has a lot of extra info you should check out if you want to know even more. Frank would move to Washington State and would continue teaching students, although the last record of a school that I could find was a place called Tiger Rock Academy in Mill Creek, Washington, and it appears to be operating as something else now. That didn't stop many people from adopting his fast Duke's Roo system and using it as their own base of teaching, as there are still many schools that purport to do so, and Frank has many people willing to fervently defend him as well. He does still teach privately and give seminars to any law enforcement or military group that will have him, and outside of some interviews here and there, he has mostly kept quiet since leaving Hollywood. Quiet except, of course, for a very active Facebook page that he consistently uses as a base of operations for his war against his enemies like Sheldon Ledich, Don the Dragon Wilson, Stephen K. Hayes, pretty much anyone who disputes his claims. And so here goes my ultimate plea to Frank. We don't care anymore even if it is all bullshit. Truly, Frank, most of us don't. This is a fantastic story and you are clearly a gifted writer. It will suck, you will have to eat some shit from some people and take some L's on the chin worse than any Kumite strike, but let's be honest man, you've been doing that anyway. Admit it's all exaggerated or untrue. Be honest with everyone and be honest with yourself. However, that's probably not going to happen. It's vastly more likely that I'll get sued by Frank for defamation, as he has seemingly traded in the dim mock in favor of his new favorite finishing move, the threat of a lawsuit. At this point though, Frank is essentially the glass Joe of the litigious world, so I like my chances. It should stand to reason that a lot of what has been said over the course of the last two videos is educated speculation based on extensive research, and some of it is just my opinion. That's my opinion! And if somehow by miracle you are watching this, Frank, I want to refer you to your own words. Just because the truth hurts, it does not equate to hate. 
The movie created from the story you somehow surmised is absolutely iconic at this point. So many people cite Bloodsport as the inspiration for them to get into martial arts, and you do deserve to be recognized for that. So in that aspect, we thank you. But again, cut the bullshit. I'm tired of your double talk. My analysis is that I think Frank is a smart guy who understood that he never lived up to the potential that he wanted for himself, and so he decided to fake it till he made it. He just never made it in the way that he wanted, and he discovered faking it is easier. I think he truthfully has convinced himself of his story's authenticity to such a degree that he is able to easily convince others. And if you've watched episode one on The Social Network, then you'll know that you just really didn't have the ability in the 80s to fact check a bullshitter like Frank Dukes on the internet. And so it was just easier in general to con someone back then into thinking that you were an undefeated, super secret, underground world kumite deathmatch grand champion who could kill you with one touch and who slept with like 5,000 ladies. And to his credit, it appears that he is somewhat of a legit martial artist and a solid fight choreographer. But as far as his one-on-one -on -one fighting abilities, personally, I think even in his prime and peak physical and technical best, I could probably name 40 to 50 people off the top of my head that could stomp him in a real fight. And I'm not even referring to the UFC fighters that just flashed across the screen just now. I'm talking about just people I've known over the course of my life. No, no, no. Rough on him now. No, he needs to know. Okay. He's always crying. Yeah, tough love it is. Tough love. Wake up, idiot. I'll even go one further and say that it's a bit sad when the person cast to play you in your movie is a more accomplished martial artist than you are. And if they wanted to really be true to life, a better casting choice might have been Sensei Steven Seagal. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Because now, I will snatch every motherfucker birthday. I can admit that there were times throughout this that he even almost had me fooled with certain things for a bit of time. That's how good he is. He has shameless confidence paired with a quick responsive and well-researched mind, and he is able to find the smallest amounts of truths in details and make them work to fit his narrative. This lends itself well to getting people to buy into what you're selling. He's a man who fell in love with his own legend, but this legend is ultimately like the epitome of the old saying. What doesn't come out in the wash will come out in the rinse. That's going to wrap it up, everybody. What did you think? Did I slay my white whale, or is this simply destined to be one of my own personal guilty pleasures? Son of a bitch. Is that good enough, guys? If you enjoyed the video, please do all the things to all the buttons and check us out on the socials to stay up to date. We also have a Patreon now if you would like to support this channel. There is only one tier, which is $2, and in return, I will give you perks like a producer credit. Ooh, fancy. And in the future, I plan to add things like early access and the ability to vote on the next video as well. We're a small outfit here, and so every little bit helps and is appreciated. Give me a quarter, $5, anything! People, people! With that said, allow me to leave you with the real post credits that Frank truly deserves. Thank you for watching. See you next time.
Dukes' way, 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 Dukes' way. book out called from vietnam to van dam from vietnam to van dam oh my god that's 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 the that's the blooper right there fuck oh <sighs>